Welcome, everybody. This is the Life Enthusiast Online Radio and TV Network, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. I'm your co host, Scott Patton, and joining us as usual is the health coach and life enthusiast, our founder, chief bottle washer, and fearless leader, Martin Patella. Hey, Martin, how are you doing today? Feeling really good today and i would like to remind you of the story as how can you tell a pioneer from the settler how can you tell the pioneer from the settler martin the pioneer is the one with the face down in the mud with the arrows in his back <laughs> it reminds me of the don't shoot the messenger uh story yeah that too that too that uh, segues very nicely into one of the things that we want to talk about today and that is um part of part of what issue we want to talk about is sometimes people want to hold on to their illness and there's you know a lot of times we you know there's hmm, there's two sides or five sides i guess to illness like some people say the illness starts out here outside the physical body because it's a spiritual thing it's a an emotional thing it's a mental thing and then it gets into the body and then we have to deal with it but of course if you just cut it out or give some drugs or whatever then you've gotten rid of the physical part but the cause is out the cause is out here and it's going to come back again and again and again and oftentimes particularly the fibromyalgia group people uh, they have this pain and it's very very physical and the, the, it's hard to see any spiritual, emotional, or mental, you know, thing that has to do with it. And it's quite possible that you're the person that it is just a physical thing and there isn't anything emotional in there. Uh, it's probably unusual for that to be the case, but we're certainly open to the possibilities, right? And everybody is unique. But well, uh, let, me, let me just give you a chance here. To, uh, or give you give me a chance to just butt in here sure. with the weeds, which is I like to start with the end in mind. You know, like I'm always reminded of Stephen Covey and his book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and just how fantastically clever and good and on point it was. And one of his seven winning strategies was begin with the end in mind. So the end here should be harmony, health happiness right? yes and so for me reading this book here i just pulled it off the off my shelf here this book by john sarno uh he wrote several but in that book he talks about how the subconscious mind creates diversions so that you at the conscious level are not having to deal with the unacceptable uh issues that are buried below the waterline in the subconscious typically he called it he called it the rage the rage against what happened to you and uh, how you would like to attack or obliterate or blow off or do away with and it could be your mommy your daddy your brother sister uh, the creator the world the, the classmates the whatever i mean anything and everything that ever happened to you in your life that you couldn't deal with were powerless to deal with, had to bury into the subconscious, and then never released it. And now the subconscious would like to do something, like let you say, I want to strangle you or something like that. But you, you're not allowed to say that to mommy. Yes. And, and so you bury it, and in the, in the meantime, you you know, this, this psychological whack-a-mole is where you stuff something down, it pops up somewhere else. And it doesn't look like the same thing. So then you think, well, obviously it's not, I've got a good relationship with my mom. It has nothing to do with mom. It's that woman over there. Right. And, and it, it's nothing to do with it. Uh, many people end up with this lollipop moment where you're a three years old child and you're uh, having a dinner and your sister is finished eating and mommy gives her the lollipop and you say i also want lollipop and mommy says to you you can and will have your lollipop when you're finished eating your dinner yes that all is skipped and erased 
the only thing that remains now is the I am unworthy, I'm unlovable, and they never give me what I deserve. I got no lollipop. Yeah, I was not given the lollipop when I asked for it. Yeah. So anyway. and so anyway, so there's that there's that thing, and now you're a 30-year-old professional who still has unresolved issues of the lollipop. And it shows up in different ways. Yes. Usually yeah, I remember self-sabotaging ways. Yeah, totally. I mean, I remember when I started dealing with my chronic problems, right? Like I fell apart when I was 25 because the uh, mercury toxicity rapidly accelerated my decline. Like I just went to crap. Like I was crawling on all fours to get out of bed to the toilet because I couldn't walk. At 25. At 25, yeah. And I was thinking, oh, my God. Is this where it's going to go? Am I going to just be in a wheelchair on drugs? Um, well, it's looked like that. But anyway, so I started dealing with the stuff. I didn't know what was all buried in there, but I, I was an inquisitive kind of fellow. So I started digging in. I wanted to know. So by the time I was about 33, I had a whole lot of answers about how messed up I was and how I could undo the messed upness. <laughs> and I know you did a whole bunch of searching, soul searching, searching, yes. whatever. Anyway, I, I decided that I was going to become a hypnotherapist. So I got myself certified as a clinical hypnotherapist because I wanted to get the education. I wanted to know what's in there, right? Yeah. It's like the little boy who wants to cut the frog open and see what's inside it, right? Well, I wanted to cut open the subconscious mind and see how it operated. And did you? And would you well, yeah, to, to a large extent. Yeah, I'm now able to see a lot of my stuff. And yet, still, my stuff is still my stuff that I'm having to deal with. Like, I'm so far from perfect, it's... Uh, <laughs> You know, the more I know, the more I know how little I know. You know, just to segue for a second, I was uh, watching a friend of mine on a Facebook Live thing talk, and he said something really profound. It was just like, wow. He Somebody asked, the, the story he tells is somebody asks him, who is your hero? And uh, he says, well, my hero, I have lots of heroes, but my number one hero is me. 10 years from now, that person that I'm going to be 10 years from now, that's my hero. And then so 10 years go by and the same person comes up and he says, okay, who is your hero? You're now 10 years older. Are you your hero? He goes, no. He says, I'm nowhere near being the hero that I wanted to be 10 years ago, but I'm closer. And my hero is the guy I'm going to be 10 years from now. And he says, it never ends. He says, you, you look forward to say, okay, how can I grow? How can I get better in the next 10 years? And that's what I want to do. And that's, yep. <laughs> that was my, I don't know if heroes actually would be the appropriate. Yeah, it's a beautiful but, line. You know, I remember my mentor, one of my mentors said, you're either green and growing or ripe and rotting. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's what reminds me of that, right? Like if, I mean, I have met many 65-year-olds who have uh, been vibrant and full of curiosity and still interested, still asking questions. Yes. And then I've met many 44-year-olds who were finished growing. They already knew all the answers. Their mind was closed, and they were done. They, they, they may have had 20 more years of experience, but it was not going to be 20 years of experience. It is going to be... 20 times one year of the same experience. You know, you reminded me of something that happened to my best friend when I was in my early 20s. And, and, and before I tell you what that is, the, the, a couple of people have said, you know, Scott, you're 60. Are you going to stop? Are you going to retire? And I'm like, are you kidding? I love doing this. I love getting on with you, Martin, and talking about all these interesting things that we talk about and health and everything else. And I love the work that we do together. And I love the other stuff that I do, my other projects and courses that we put together. And I have no desire to retire like my grandparents or my parents did. And 
And when you were talking, this little light bulb went off and I thought, you know, like, where did that come from? Because all of my family has headed towards retirement and been retired when they're 60 or 65 or 55. You know, they, this is what my family dynamic says to do. And Scott is going, no way. And I want to be like doing a podcast with you and go, oh, Martin, it's time for me to go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's that would be, you know, the happiest way in the world for me. It's like, all right, just signing off for the last time, click, and then just, <laughs> and then they just pick me up and take me away. Uh, but I've got an insight now into why that is. And I would never thought of this in the last 40 years, but my friend's father was, I was very close with him. He was a Danish guy who used to be on the, the fishing boats in Denmark on the North Sea. Like he was tough as nails. And when he came to Canada, he became a janitor. And that was his life, was being a janitor in this school. And within one month of him retiring, he died. And it was just like he had no, I mean, I because I, I was so close to the family, I knew what he was thinking. Like he had put this thing off as long as he could. And it was finally like, no, you have to retire. And it was his whole life. Like his, it was, to be honest, it was more important than his wife. And it was more important than his son. Because yeah. if it was, well, wasn't, he would have stayed. But yeah, just, I would call it the, sorry, Scott. I would call it the identity, right? Our yes. personal identity is... Mm -hmm. When we are invested in being the job that we do, then if the job ends, then I guess we do too. Yeah, and that was exactly the way he looked at it. And I thought, wow. Like, so his mind, I mean, he was perfectly healthy, and then he was gone, right? Like, it wasn't like he was sick, and it took him 10 years. He was just, no, I'm gone. And okay. Then... Yeah, those are beautiful tangents. So um, about the pain in the body, right? Yes. So the pain, I think, is a diversion created by the subconscious mind as an outlet for an unacceptable rage that cannot be expressed. And in my estimation, when I was trying to intellectualize the stuff, I imagined that at least 80, if not 90 percent of all chronic disease is actually caused by that first and foremost, rather than the other things which we at Life Enthusiast fiddle with, like we fiddle with environment, toxic load, and uh, we fiddle with nutrition and toxic burden, and we fiddle with uh, stagnation and uh, lymphatic system and so on. So and really what you're saying is, is that like in your case, the mercury sped up the process. If you hadn't gone to the dentist and had 25 fillings, maybe at 25 you would have been okay, and at 35 you would have been a little bit worse, and then 45 you would have been calling to, as opposed to the fact that the mercury came in and your body went, okay, here's my excuse, let's just all collapse, and we collapse. And so the story can be different for everybody, but the process is, is probably very, very similar. Because we do see people who have a lot of chronic pain and they go and they do the EFT tapping or they go, you know, pendulum swinging or they go to meditation or they go and do things. And all of a sudden they, they find themselves maybe dealing with some of these issues and getting better. So when, when, when before they were a super A personality type and, and didn't give themselves any time or any self love or do any of the things that they wanted to do. Right. And I sometimes think that the, when we have these health crises, or even if they're just like small little health issues, it's really our body saying, which to me, the subconscious mind, you know, what is the subconscious mind? And in my thinking, it's the body, <laughs> strangely enough, yeah. right? Because yeah, yeah. yeah. what it's are you feeling? Mind. You know, so I don't know, what am I feeling? Well, like, well, I have a pain here. <laughs> That's what I'm feeling. Okay, you know, you're starting to get in touch with your body and your, and your subconscious, because it's where it all happens, right? As opposed to before, I thought the subconscious was like, oh, I don't know, out there somewhere, right? And yeah. then... So, so I, I, as you're saying it, you know, I'm thinking, you and I have tried to introduce to our audience uh, several times something interesting. Like I remember our 
encounters with Dr. Michael Amendolara, yes, who, who is a phenomenal uh, NLP practitioner and rapid pain elimination practitioner, and he is totally willing to put himself on the line. Like he tells people, uh, for 500 bucks, you can get any one thing fixed. Or if you really have a big problem for 2,500 bucks, I will work with you and I will resolve the problem to your satisfaction. You will not pay me unless I have solved your problem. Yeah, and we've talked to people that he's helped. So it's not like... Yeah, it's, it's not... It's not an not, empty promise. Yeah. Right. No, it's not empty. It's totally there. And I'm thinking 2,500 bucks is a huge barrier, right? For me, 2,500 bucks would have been, oh, but then what the heck? I have wasted, uh, not wasted, but used up 20 times that on chiropractor visits. Yes. 30 times that on supplements. So if you have any respect for my gray hair and the experience that I have um, gained the hard way, you know, the school of hard knocks, take it from me. The 2500 bucks seems to be like a big number, but because it's guaranteed, it's a phenomenal bargain. I'm telling you, I have spent 10 times that on chiropractors and 100 times that on supplements and who knows what else. It's nothing. So that's that's my take on it anyway. So one of the things that we're saying is be open to the fact that you have there's more than just the physical body that is in pain. There's you know there's pain in the emotional body, there's pain in the mental body, probably in the spiritual body and it's showing up in the physical body because that's the only place where you can actually feel anything. Right? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like the computer. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on on the inside, but only when you print it out, you can take it to someplace else, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. So, and the other thing is, you, I, we really want people to be open-minded, because just because you, I don't know, you like something or you think something doesn't mean that the rest of the world likes it or thinks the same way or it has the same impact. And you may have tried something and it didn't work. And there can be a million reasons why it didn't work. And somebody else can try it and it did work. And maybe, because this is this comes down to what we talk about all the time with metabolic typing. There are certain people when they eat a certain food, they feel energized and good. And there are certain people that eat the same food and they want to go to sleep or depressed or kill themselves, or they have road rage or what it, you know, so we react differently to different foods. Why? And if you don't think you react to food, have five beer and try to walk across the room. Um, we, you know, what we put into our body has a big impact on us. What we put into our mind has a big impact on us. And so just because it didn't work for you or you're not open minded enough to try it or you don't want to try it doesn't mean that it wouldn't work for somebody else. And so what we find is that people hang on very, very tightly to their sickness. Uh, I've tried everything. Because, because it's part of their current self-image. So who they are. Yeah. Right, yeah. So and I am cancer, I'm full of cancer, I'm a cancer victim, I'm full of this. No, no, I wouldn't, no, uh -uh, no, no, I disagree. Not like that, no. I am the person who resents the thing that happened to me back when, and I will not let it go. I will carry that with me. That vibration will give rise to the cancer. I, I'm, not, I'm not defining myself as me and cancer. I'm just defining myself as having those grudges. They will create the cancer. Or whatever else it may be. Or whatever, right? But it's not just the grudges. It's just whatever is down there. You, you don't even have to know. I remember being on a massage table, just getting deep tissue massage, and uh, some part of my body is being worked on, and, and tears are just running out of my eyes. I'm just 
just bawling. I could never know what I was bawling about. Mm. That was never revealed. But the therapist said, well, this is good. This happens to a lot of people. It's just a release. I have just released a stored memory that required you to, there was some grief that needed yeah, to be like that. So we could look at these little stored memories and little stored emotions as um, blights on a tree or something, right? So if they just stay there, then pretty soon they're going to kill the tree. But if you, being the orchard caretaker, come along, see the blight, which, of course, you're the tree too, and you work it out so it's gone, then you're going to have a healthier time and a healthier life. Yes. Yeah, freer expression. And I guess all of these things are essentially the um, blocking the expression of bliss or blocking of the joy. Yes. We're recording, so this is for uh, for live. <laughs> come, Maureen, come, come here now. You want to be now. To, we want to show my wife to the world. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, this, Hi Maureen. This, hey, Scott. This here is what I live for. This is what... All these 40 last years I spent nurturing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so just in case you're wondering, I am happily married. Yes, that's awesome. Anyway, sidebar. So let's just get back to it. So there there was this other session, Scott, and I did with uh, Ashok Gupta or Gupta yeah. from London. Yeah who is a phenomenal guy who explained to us in that seminar, we could put a link to that, how the amygdala in the brain, which is a particular tiny, not very large piece somewhere in there, actually gets physically changed and starts creating a processing in the brain that causes the response to be um, not relative to the stimulus. Yeah. In, he put it in as, a really good way. He said, and you you do this all the time. You, know, you you take a hammer and you hit your nail, you hit your hand, finger, ow, right? And what happens with most people is after a few minutes, the body says, okay, this is not life-threatening. I can ignore it, even though it's still painful or whatever. I, I end up kind of ignoring it. I don't pay so much attention to it. It's maybe it's a little bit, but not too bad. But people like who have fibromyalgia, what they found is when they hit the finger, that owl pain, that's really painful pain, it doesn't stop. And it continues and continues and continues. And that's so that's pretty amazing, you know, because people say, oh, they tell me it's all in my head. Well, we're, yes, <laughs> it yes, is it actually, is actually, but not the way they mean it. It actually is part of your, you know, it's kind of like if you poked your eye and your eye was red and blurry and water coming out, and you couldn't see it. And you said to somebody, I can't see out of my eye, they they would look and they'd say, oh, well, it's bloody and blurry and everything else. And yeah, it's probably right. You can't see out of your eye. But because they can't see this piece in your brain here that's a little bit off or maybe a lot off, they, they don't believe you. And that's what's funny is, is an hour come to the point where I think it won't be long before we have a test for this problem. We, we may call it fibromyalgia, but I think you're going to call it chronic pain or in, inability to deal with pain signals from your body properly. And then they start to be able to work on that. And then all of a sudden you're not going to be in this uh, situation that you're in now. Right. So the autoimmune inflammatory condition has multiple components. We have been identifying them to people saying toxicity, malnutrition, stagnation, and the invisible stuff. And we could call it trauma, for example. And it's the unresolved trauma. And you can have the childhood trauma, but you can have electromagnetic trauma that is ongoing right now. Right. You could have a cell tower half a block from your home that just keeps radiating you, or you could have a Wi-Fi repeater in your classroom that this has been documented time and time again is uh, as soon as they shut off the Wi-Fi in the school, children settled down and started being able, stopped being ADD, started being able to focus right. on things. Uh, so yeah, electromagnetics. Yes to food, you know, the, the common irritant foods, so the wheat, dairy, well, actually, all the industrial foods, they're yeah. refined, refined. Anything in a box or a can. 
with a barcode. Yeah. Yeah. All that. Ah. Anyway, so those inputs. But mind over matter. Nine times out of ten, it can be overcome. It can be suppressed. And you can I can demonstrate it. Go watch a hockey game that you're really into, if hockey is your thing. Or a football game. The next, sure, whatever, whatever event, concert, if you will. And for the next two hours, you will forget that you are that your arm is broken, that your heart is broken, that your fibromyalgia is in flare. You can totally forget it because your brain can focus on that which it will focus on. Yeah. And exclude all else. You know, you you just brought up a different aspect. I just thought of something in a little bit different way than what you were saying. And, and like, is it possible that one of the reasons why the, everybody goes to these sporting events or concerts where they can, it's the only place where it's publicly acceptable to be yelling your head off and just, yeah, get it, and, you know, or cry because they're lost or whatever, right? And yep. I think sometimes that's why we're into, like so many millions of people are into it and so many people are into actually performance because yes. it gives them that opportunity to express. And, yep. you know, we have actors and actresses that are in movies and they're just yelling and doing all or whatever they're doing. And yep. they have this opportunity to just get that stuff out and express it in a way that, well, because outside of those places, when we express like that, we're usually taken to jail because it, we've been threatened. It's been threatening, right? Like you had a couple too many beer and you throw stuff against the wall and you yell and you scream and the neighbors call the police and they take you away before you can hurt somebody or somebody gets hurt because we are not yeah. very good at yeah. dealing with those things when they right. become expressed because we don't do it very often. Right. So when we are not in a story, we're now in our own story, which could be pretty miserable. Yes. Right. So that, that miserable place that we're in will amplify and regrow and it just fills all available time, space and capacity. <sighs> Well, anyway, so there are tools that can help us resolve that. Neurolinguistic programming has totally answered it. It is validated, available, functions well. It just has a bad rap because people can't believe that it takes only a heartbeat to go from before to after. Yeah. And the before, you could be a... Uh, I don't know, whatever whatever I can put up. Fear of snakes, that's what got it famous, right? Yeah, fear of snakes, fear of pho phobia of every sort. You can have a phobia before, and then after the phobia is gone, you can just play with the thing. But it, it could be worse. I mean, I, for instance, believe that you can cure a child molester by fixing his associations about what is a turn-on and what is not. Mm. The same way you can rewire a person how they feel about snakes is you can rewire how the person relates to their sexuality. I don't know this for a fact, but it's possible that that uh, what you find attractive, whether it's inappropriate or culturally wrong or whatever, could be rewired. I, I, I know of a few examples. I just don't know because the mainstream hasn't really bought into it, so the numbers don't support me well right well we also have a society that believes in punishment and not cure for anything it doesn't agree with oh yes that too no. yeah the war on drugs is fighting the emotionally distraught person who is seeking an outlet from the moment of hell that he's having right like i would just as soon snort something or inject something or whatever something just to not feel the pain that's what the person is saying to themselves as they do what they do. Yeah, they don't want to feel the pain. Yeah. They will use alcohol. They will use whatever, cocaine, marijuana, sex, work. Right. Um, you name it. Just about any distraction only to not feel that which is too painful to feel. 
And then when it gets uh, suppressed, if it gets suppressed and suppressed and suppressed, it comes out as your cancer, your heart attack, your chronic illness, all, yes. the, all the other things. Yeah. Mal malfunction, soft tissue damage, where the chi, the energy, the prana, the life force stops flowing freely. Wherever the chi pulls because of an impediment to flow, pain develops. Yeah, that's why acupuncture kind of works a lot because you stick a needle into a spot where there has been impediment to free flow and you release that blockage and flow is restored and pain is gone. Right. But what happens in our body is energy flows through it. This is yes. the only way I can lift my hand is because there's a whole bunch of energy going into my muscles and my nerves that are telling me, okay, you know, you said you wanted to do this and it's going to go and do it. And so we have a hard time when we talk about, you know, the type of energy you talked about. Well, oh, so there's a blockage here and that's why this finger is not working properly. You know, how we, we don't realize it's like we have copper wires, like we have copper wires that have the lights in the house. Right? Yeah, yeah. And we have pipes to take the, the poo out. And we have pipes to yeah. take water in and... We have all the, the body has the same sort of things and and they get blockaged and they get stopped. But the yep. whole idea of, oh, you've got these lines of energy. Like, are you kidding me? Only been, what, 5,000 years of practice by the Chinese. You would think that that would be enough for us to believe that there's a that aspect to life going on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and... Uh... Yeah, anyway, it's well-researched, and people who understand it well, it, way better than what you and I can describe, they can tell you that this spot over here, right here, this very spot, is the spot that deals with headaches. So when you massage this spot, your headache will go away. What the heck? Yeah. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of those spots for the people that, uh, that study it. And it's yes. And there's two, like there's this one here, and then there's another one somewhere else that is a brother or sister of it. And so yes. you can do either one. Reflexology, right? The massaging yes. of the feet is all yeah. about that. So. Yeah, and the energy flow, the pulses, and so on. There are wonderful methods, the body talk, the quantum healing, the uh, the uh, key, what is it called, Reiki. Um, Reiki, yes. Yeah, I mean, there's so many EFT. ways. It's, oh, yes, that and NLP and hypnosis and uh, and rapid pain, rapid pain elimination by Amendolara or or you can have the Gupta method and Gupta is affordable right like that's like 200 bucks 250 yes. I think it was yeah to get you the materials that are enough information to teach you what you need Doing. Now, of course, that will require a commitment. It's a process. It's you need to retrain. So it's a six-month process rather than the in one afternoon I'll get you fixed of the rapid pain elimination. But still, six months isn't bad. This one here, when I did this one, that took me six weeks. I read the book and I practiced and I did. The book cost me maybe twenty bucks if I remember right. Right. And and I honestly was free of pain. And I was full of it before I started. So, people, <laughs> take it from an old master. <laughs> there is such a thing as it's all in your head. And you can get it out of your head and you can make a difference. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that we wanted to get across in this session was the fact that We've come across a lot of people that are very closed minded and they're hanging on to a lot of things like and you can tell when the reaction is irrational. Right. Yes. You know, like, yeah. like, yelling, yelling back at you. You know nothing. Yeah. You, what do you know? You cannot walk in my shoes. You've never seen what I've been. Uh, whatever. Right. Yeah. How like, dare you? Yeah. Like uh, you're really unique. There's only seven billion of us. I think it's, you know, I think somebody has gone through what you've gone through. Uh, but that's one of the things that we really noticed was, wow, like somebody would post something and everyone would blanket. Our, well, there would be two part, two sides. It's like a war. Like, yeah, yeah that's su right. Support, yeah. support and, uh, and uh, what's the other opposite um, disagreement? Disagreement, right? And 
it was it wasn't like here's why uh, I think that this is okay to do. Here's yeah. why I think this isn't okay to do. It was like you're uh, you're judgmental. You're very judgmental, Martin. I just can't believe that you would even think that. How could you even yeah. think that? I've been doing that for 25 years. I, I, I've had my my problem for 24 years, but I I just don't see how you could possibly. You're just so mean and nasty. Yeah. I don't want to have anything to do with you. And of yeah, course, you nothing is going to happen and going to change if you're open to the. One of my friends <laughs> says that what is the most expensive thing that you can own? Closed mind. Closed mind. Yeah. His friend did I guess it right? You did guess it right. You know, we have this closed mind and then there's no opportunity for possibility because what if the reason that you're so upset is because that is the reason. So, you know, yep. let's, let's pick on smoking. I have, uh, I don't know, I have a tumor on the back of my head and I smoke a pack of cigarettes. And then someone says, well, you know, this thing here is, it, maybe it's because you're smoking a pack of cigarettes and if you stop smoking, maybe it would go away. No way, you just hate smokers. You just think this, 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 whatever. Like you're just another one of those blah, 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 right? Yep. Uh, so instead of saying, well, you know, maybe I should look into that. Maybe God or the universe or whoever brought this person into my life to, you know, kind of yep. give me a, Wake up, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I spent three weeks in Turkey, and one of the people that I got to know very well was probably in her 70s, 75, and she had two beautiful dogs and a beautiful cat, and she just finished having surgery on her shoulder because the tendon in the shoulder had gotten really, really thin. She loved to garden. She was very active, and so her hand was in a sling for six weeks, three weeks before I got there. And then she would go in and she'd start to see the therapist and her arm started to get bad and everything else. And but she and she smoked and she gave this beautiful speech that I think she must have practiced every day for the last 40 years or whenever she started about why she smoked. And, and I mean, maybe she saw something on my face that looked judgmental. Maybe she said, well, you don't smoke, so you probably think it's bad that I smoke. I don't care. Do whatever you want. It's not, not my business. But I could not help thinking, here was this woman who loved, you know, digging in the garden and doing all these things, being really active. Her tendon had broken plaps, something really bad. They had to go in. They had to put surgery. They had to do whatever they had to do. And then she had to not move for six weeks. And now she goes to therapy to kind of get it going. And I'm wondering if in two or three years, they're going to have to do surgery there again or somewhere else. And I wonder if it's possible that the reason she had that was because of all the poisons and toxins in her smoking I went there, right? Yeah. I didn't say anything. I, it wasn't, it's none of my business. Yeah. But that's what goes through my head. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're doing something. I don't have, I have good lungs. You know, oh, I've got, you know, my tendon here fell apart. Yeah. So, um, hard to know. Hard to know, right? You know, and maybe, so who knows? Because you can't go back 40 years, not smoke for 40 years, and compare yourself. Right. The good thing is that if you stop, it only takes a year before you're back to as good as new. Because the body does have this homeostatic, uh, self-repairing autopilot system that is aiming towards balance and health rather than the opposite of that. That's the but good you know, news. As you're, right as you're saying it, I'm thinking, damn, I haven't exercised enough in the last two years. Right? Like I have been putting other things ahead of that. Yes. Choices, choices, choices. And I'm thinking, well, I might be aging faster because of that, because I'm not maintaining sufficient circulation. Well, not circulation, I'm good, but physical strength, for instance, right? right? I might not have enough of that. But anyway, it's just self-reflecting on that. I'm not perfect. I just happen to know a few answers about a few things. Yes. And those I'm... Happy to share because I'm quite certain I know those well because I've learned them the hard way. Right. And so here we are telling people, uh, yes, we can help you with nutrition, detox, exercise, and understanding. And it's great. But please be aware that the larger reason for illness is in the invisible.
it's in the subtle, it's in the vibrational. And uh, solving that is a huge thing. So EFT, we have a wonderful practitioner in uh, in our podcast uh, directory, Joan Kaler. Yeah. She's she's helped so many people fix their holes, right? And she's not That's the right. only EFT practitioner on, There's on lots, the There's but she's very, very good. I've yeah. done some courses with her and I've done some uh, some work with her. And like here's here's one of the things that you have to understand. There is eight billion people on the planet, and I'll say there are five who are willing to look into the dirty, dark places of their psyche. In other words, to dig through their and they can dig deep, 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 deep. I'm gonna say there's five, and it's nobody listening to this, and it's not you or I. So and, and they're probably fictitious people, but I will give the world five out of seven billion or eight billion people. And what happens when you do any of this type of work by yourself is you go to a very comfortable level. You do not go deep at all. It's She calls it global. We're just doing global tapping. We're just tapping on the kind of the stuff that's obvious to everybody, including you, and we're not do going deep because you cannot go deep alone because you can't see it, right? Our eyes look out, they don't look in. Uh, we, oh no, I got along really good with my sister all my life. There's no issue with my sister. And so we were going through a process uh, that she was doing with me and she asked me some questions or like, I oh, know it's all tapping, right? So we're tapping and then she says something and I say something and she says, stop. I go, what? She says, we have to go on a tangent. What do you mean? Well, she says, we're kind of going this way and we're getting progress, but there is this deep root that goes off on this other direction that you just exposed, like you unknowingly, you know, dug it up. Yes. You couldn't you see, you couldn't see it, but I know I've been doing this for 27 years. I know that nothing we do here is really going to take until we get this other root out. So we stopped and went after this other root that I would never, ever have dreamt of. I have, see, I still don't remember what it is. So that just shows you. My subconscious is still trying to protect me from it. And we got through that, and then we continued on our but way. But that's the beauty of the NLP, right? Even yeah. though I don't know why, I'm doing such and such, and I'm willing to let it go. Yes. Right? And we just go, and we just willing to let it go and allow it to dissipate back into the nothingness from which it came, giving it back to the universe. Thank you very much. It's released. Yeah. And... It's gone. <laughs> anyway. So. so what I'm saying is, is you need help. You need to know that you're not on this journey alone. That, the, that we live in a wonderful planet. And the planet keeps bringing people into our lives that are, are there to help us with our growth and with our healing. And we may take an axe out. <laughs> you know, we grab an axe and chase them with an axe. But that's because we're so resistant to the healing. It's not really anything to do with them. So, okay, so we have given you three different ideas that totally, not us, just people we have met, four ideas that I can think of. Um, try them all, try one of them, see if you if your resources are limited, just get a book and read it. Or pick up a course, we could put a link to a course, you can learn that course for very little money and learn how to do it yourself, right? That's right. You can go a long way on self-care. That's right. And as you're going along on that way, you're going to meet people. Like there are lots of support groups, right? For for all sorts of different things. And you find the one that really helps you with your with your growth and, and you stick with it and you keep going. And I think the biggest thing is the fact that there is hope. Like if you're in a really desperate health situation, it doesn't have to remain that way. You just have to believe that you can change and then start taking steps. The belief starts first because it's out here. Like, I don't think I'm ever going to get well. It's going to be pretty hard for you to get well. But once you think, I just need to get these things figured out and worked on, and I'm going to be okay, then you start taking your steps. And the door is open when you take the steps. The doors stay closed when you just stand in one spot. It's been my experience. 
All right. So thank you very much for joining us, everybody. We kind of reached the end of our time here together today. Uh, I'm Scott Patton. Martin, if somebody wanted to talk with you a little bit more about their specific issues, uh, are you willing to uh, take their call? I am always willing to engage. I'm um, at life-enthusiast.com. Look it up. Under podcasts, you can find uh, our past recordings. Under uh, There are all kinds of articles there, lots of it. But if you want to talk, the number is 866 543-3388 and we answer it from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Pacific time and um, give us a call we'll uh, give you the best of us awesome and you always do Martin you've been watching and or listening to the Life Enthusiast online radio and TV network restoring vitality to you and to the planet thanks for joining us everybody we'll see you next time bye bye